In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Dear Reverend Father, dear faithful, to thee, O Lord, have I lifted up my soul. In thee, O my God, I put my trust. Let me not be ashamed. These are the words of the offertory verse for today's Mass, and they form the subject of my sermon today, a difficult subject, the subject of trust. In our world today, we are a little bit bankrupt on trust. Trust is something that's very hard to build up in another person and very easy to break. Trust is fragile. And we have many leaders today who have broken trust. They have manifested in various ways that we cannot trust them to do what is for our own good. So I can illustrate this by just asking a few questions. Do you trust our current president to make the right decisions for our country? Do you trust or would you trust the salvation of your soul to Pope Francis? Do you trust Governor Polis is making all the right decisions for the citizens of Colorado? And I only need to ask these questions for them more or less to be answered. We don't trust. This trust has been broken. And what we, we must avoid in today's world is developing a certain cynicism where because our trust has been broken in so many of today's leaders and our world is broken, that we render ourselves unable to trust because trust is absolutely necessary for our lives. First of all, we must have a very great trust in God, but also we must have a great trust in our fellow human beings by the design of God. Those who lose the ability to trust over time, eventually, as I say, are incapable of trusting God in the way that they should. And what I'm talking about is essentially they're incapable of the supernatural virtue of hope. By the supernatural virtue of hope, is what we, what we do is we, we say to God, I trust that the promises that you have made to me, you will fulfill. And a lot of these promises, not all of them, but a lot of these promises concern the next life. They're not given to us until this life is over. So it, it demands a great trust on our part. We're not given these things up front. We're not given eternal happiness up front. We just have to trust that God will fulfill what he says he will give us, that he will give us eternal happiness after this life is over. Do you trust that living according to the Catholic faith in your actions is the best road to happiness in this life? Do you trust that? Do you trust that if you live up to the faith in this life, that once you die, that in fact, you will be given eternal happiness with God? Do you believe that the greatest actions that you can do in this life are supernatural activities in the state of grace? And that these little activities that you do earn for you eternal reward. If you're in a situation where you know that doing what God wants you to do in that situation is going to create a lot of difficulties for you, is going to put you in a difficult situation, whereas going against God is going to make things easy for you and comfortable, do you trust that if you do what God wants instead of rejecting God will be the best thing and that God will take care of you if you take care of doing what he wants, that he will take care of you. The trust that we have of God is, it must be very great. And if we, if we do not trust God completely in this life, it will create many problems for us. But what is interesting and what we must notice um, and is, is that God has, besides him asking us to trust him, 
He has made it that our human, in our human condition, it is also necessary by his will that we trust our fellow human beings. Not all of them. And we have to give our trust very judiciously. We have to be prudent in the trust that we give. But there are certain things, certain important things we cannot accomplish in this life unless we trust our fellow man. I just want to give two examples of this. You know that God has instituted the state of marriage, and you cannot form a family unless you enter into marriage. But what kind of trust does marriage demand of you by the will of God? It demands an incredible trust of you. You come up the aisle and you pledge your life to another person. And you say to that person, I pledge to be with you for the rest of my life. I pledge to be faithful to you, not to betray you for the rest of my life. I pledge to have children by you and to raise those children with you for the rest of my life. For you to be willing to do that, for you to reach that point where you say, I do, on your marriage day, you have to have a very great trust in that person. And this is what God asks of you. God has made marriage. He has instituted the family, and he's saying, this is how you do family, with that great act of trust on the day of your marriage. It's interesting how, how much trust is bound up with love. Trust and love go together. If you, tr the more you trust someone, the more you are willing to give yourself to that person. If you do not trust somebody, you say, I have to be very careful. I must not give myself this person because it's going to come back against me and, and cause problems for me. Whereas the more you trust, if you trust a person very much, you're willing to give more and more. Father Edward Pop, whom, whom I've actually quoted before, but he says, trust is the measure of our, law, of our love. And what, what happens is that children, the children that you have and that grow up in your family, they learn trust from you. So God designs marriage so that it's built on an act of trust, and then you bring children into the world, and through the trust that you've given to one another and the way you live out your marriage, they in turn learn to trust. And children are by, very instinctively extremely trusting of their parents. That's, that's the way God meant it to be. But if the parents, if the, if the parents cooperate with that and they, they, they give their love to their children, um, they are very consistent with their children, then the children learn in turn to trust others and they become capable of marrying. They become capable at one point of committing themselves to another person. But if the, cha if the parents break the trust of their, of their children, they're wicked to their children or they do not raise them in, in the proper way, they, they do not treat them in the way that they should, then the children find it very difficult to trust. Once they grow up, they find it very difficult to get married. So that's just one example of the trust that, that God demands of us in this life of our fellow human beings for us to accomplish certain things. Unless you trust, unless you have the ability to trust, you cannot have the good of a family. But another thing you cannot have that I want to point out by the design of God is the salvation of your soul. For that too, you have to have a great trust in your fellow human beings. We know that our Lord did come upon this earth and he did teach people directly. But that only happened for three years in the history of the world. There were only three years in the history of the world in a very specific geographical area that God himself was on this earth teaching people the way to heaven. The rest of the time, God works through human instruments, through merely human instruments, and he leaves, leads to us to, to decide, to judge. Like, who do I trust is saying to me what is true about how I get to heaven? Who do I choose to be the one to teach me how to get to heaven? You know, this is the story of, 
of St. John Vianney when he was going to ours. And um, he, he ran into this little boy and he, he, he says, how do I get to ours? And the boy says, okay, you go down this road. And he says, you've taught me the way to ours. I will teach you the way to heaven. And this is what has happened for all of us. If, if you're here, perhaps it was your parents. You trusted your parents and they said, this is our Catholic faith. This is how you get to heaven. Perhaps it was your religion teacher when you went to school who, who says, this, this is the way you unite yourself with God. And at some point, you reach the moral certainty. You, can't, you, can't, you didn't reach mathematical certainty. None of us can reach mathematical certainty, but you reached a moral certainty. You said, beyond a reasonable doubt, this is the path by which I get to heaven. There's something that is very important for us to notice about these examples that I've given, wherein God creates our human condition and he expects us to get very important goods in our life, the good of family and the good of the salvation of our souls through human beings. And this is that God is the first one who trusts. God trusts you because he's given you the ability to have children. He's given you the power to children. And when he does that, he says, I trust you. I give you this power. You bring children in the world. I trust you to cherish these children, to love these children, to do what's right by these children. His act of trust goes to you first. You trust one another. You become married. You build that trust in your children. It's the same with the priesthood. God says to the priests, I give you my power to sanctify others. I give you this commission to teach people the way to heaven. And yes, these souls are yours. I give you these souls. And it's, it's in a, I think the priests are, are very conscious, like, wow, what, what a burden on our shoulders. But, but at the same time, what, what a great act of trust on the part of God. How we must be careful to use that trust well. The thing is, when trust works, there's so much good that comes from it. There's certain goods, as I said, and this is the main point of, of my sermon today. When we are able to trust more in the good, we receive more back. Whereas if we trust less in the good, if we're less capable of trusting, and we, we, and we do not find a context in which we can give our trust to our fellow human beings in order to get married, in order to save our souls, we are stunted as human beings. We are not able to reach our perfection as human beings. When you have um, a couple who, the, the husband and the wife, they trust themselves completely. They give themselves to one another completely. Then they give themselves to their children. Their children trust them. Then they trust their parish. And they, when, they, when they go to the parish, they're all in, in their parish. Um, and the, the, the children are very confident in, in the, the place where they go to learn about the salvation of their souls. This is how we get this beautiful fruit of vocations. At some point, the, the child says, I think I want to give my life to God. It's, it's built on an edifice of trust, multiple layers of trust. I just want to give you an example, just a very <clears throat> basic examples of, of this. Think about if you had some money, and you say, I want to invest my money in a stock and you research the stock and think about if if you if you saw this stock and you, you said wow this company is incredible i've never seen a company like this i i think this there's definite 100 percent chance this company is going to do well i'm going to get a good return on my stock what are you going to do with with your money you're going to invest as much of it as possible you want to give as much of that money as possible and then you're going to get a lot back. Whereas someone who looks at that same company and they say, uh, I don't know. I don't know about this company. It doesn't look that great. I'm going to give $5 for, for some stocks. 
And as a result, because of the lack of trust, they don't get much money back. What do you think about um, a boyfriend and girlfriend? They're, they're going on a hike, and, and the boyfriend says to the girlfriend, there is a really fantastic view over this canyon. And I know the way. I've been there before. And it looks scary, but we will be safe. I assure you of that. And if she trusts him, and he takes her by the hand, and he leads her over the canyon, then she gets the beautiful view. But if she does not trust him, she says, no, I'm not going to go. I'm just too afraid. Then she does not get that benefit. She does not get that good. Trust leads to commitment, leads to benefit for us. And that's just the way it is with our human condition. If we can find something that we can entrust ourselves to, give our hearts to, then the more we can invest in that thing, and it's, it's good, it's an objective good, then the more we will have a greater return, we will perfect ourselves in this life. So, I mean, you know how it works. You, you hang around a person and you, you observe them. Can I trust this person? What sort of things are you looking for in order to build that trust? Well, I just want to mention two things. First of all, a certain consistency on a person. You're looking for patterns, a pattern of behavior. It's like, well, I've known this person for two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, however long. You say, they're always so consistent. They do the same things because I've seen them act in a very regular and consistent way this amount of time. I can look into the future and say, I expect they'll continue to act that same way over a long period of time. This is part of the basis for the trust of, of getting married. Then secondly, objectivity. The person you're dealing with, how do they go about making their decisions? Do they make decisions on the basis of emotion, on the basis of feeling, on the basis of, well, they have their favorites, what have you? Or are they looking for something higher than themselves? They're, they're looking, they may, you see them make decisions sometimes that are very difficult. They might cause problems for them, but you know they're making decisions because they think that's the best decision for the good. This is the decision I need to make, even though it's going to cause me problems, in order to achieve a certain good that's outside of myself. If you see that in a person, that as well can be a great basis for trust or for, for a corporation or, or, a, or a group um, where, where you say, oh, should, should I trust this organization? You look at its ideals, you study its ideals, you study its principles. What is it about? What does it believe? What does it stand by? And has it stood by these things consistently? And if, if those ideals are true, if they are good ideals, and it's living up to those ideals, then you say, yes, I give myself to it. If it's not living up to those ideals, or the ideals are false, you say, I do not give my heart. I do not trust this thing. So, my dear faithful, this was the point at the 7 o'clock mass where I, I, did, I think I lost the 7 o'clock crowd, but we have a more devout group at the 9 o'clock. Um, I'm almost done, but there's one last thing that, that I need to mention in this sermon, and, and that is how important it is for us to have a balance in the trust that we give. There can be a defect of trust, and there can be an excess of trust. People fall into a defect of trust if they're in a situation where they observe consistency, they ob observe objectivity, the person is given, or the corporation is given, more than enough evidence that they are trustworthy, but there's still that niggling doubt in the back of the mind. It's like, well, there's a risk here. There's a risk here. I don't know if I can give myself. There's moral certainty beyond a reasonable doubt this person or entity is trustworthy, but I just don't know for sure. So they hold themselves back. They're not willing to give themselves and let's face it, all trust involves risk. There's no trust in this world that does not involve some risk. Even the most diligent person might be fooled sometimes with giving themselves. But 
let me just emphasize that absolute independence is not a Catholic ideal. It is part of our human condition that we must find things to trust in this life in order to achieve the greater goods of this life. The do-it-yourself attitude where I will always remain independent of absolutely everybody. I will not give myself. I will jealously keep my heart to myself is just not Catholic. The other side is excess of trust, and that is trust without judgment. That is the person who's naive, who's gullible. They just give their heart automatically. They, they shut off their mind. They're just like, I'm going to give my heart to this person and that person. Someone else comes along, and they're like, this relationship is, is very toxic. It's not good for you. Look at how this person's behaving. That you're, They're not treating you correctly, you know. And because the, the person has, is no longer thinking, is, is not judging anymore, is not making good judgments about the situation, um, they've just given their heart blindly, they stay in that bad situation. We are never meant to stop thinking and judging in this life. We still have to assess for the rest of our lives, even with people who we trust implicitly and, we, and they, who deserve our trust, we, we still have to observe um, yes, people are fallible. People are fallible. So God wants us to be careful about who and what we, what we trust, but he also wants us to make the effort to find what we can trust and then to give our hearts. So, my dear faithful, let us give ourselves over to this effort. Find what we can trust. Give our hearts to that thing, to those goods, so that we can reap those greater benefits and especially achieve that most important goal, that we have a very great trust of God, that, that through this human trust we mediate a very great trust in God. The kind of trust we want is, is the one spoken of in Psalm 118. The priests have to pray. Psalm 118 is like the longest psalm. It has like 200 verses or something. Um, so it, it's the only psalm where this special expression appears super spiravi. I have super hoped in you, my God. This is, this is the kind of trust we want of God through our human hope. We say to God in this psalm, you are my helper and my protector. In thy word, I have super hoped. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.